um, is a combination of things. It includes $150,000 in retirement benefits for people who are retiring um, and some small increases to uh, uh, retired teacher group insurance. As we adjust to the new regime of bringing them back from GIC, we're finding that there are some adjustments we're having to make so we're not seeing those anticipated savings materialize right away. Okay. Um, and then in the control accounts, you'll see $620,000 increase. It's $694,000. That's a combination of things. Those are contingency funds. We have a contingency in there for extra staffing. We put that contingency every year. It's a teacher in two powers because kids come in and have needs, and if we don't have a contingency, we're in rough shape off the bat. We have a contingency for salary negotiations for steps and colas. We have a contingency for sabbatical leave if we are going to grant uh, a leave this for next year. So that was all contingency types of things in, in those control accounts. And wrapping all that together, um, that's an increase of 4.7% or 1.3 million. And I'm going to pause there and see if you have any questions about the uh, expense side of this budget. Uh, Michael, without getting <clears throat> too geeky, mm -hmm. is it possible to just explain the rationale for why the state's having us do this school choice shifting thing? Um, okay. And if you can't do it simply, it's okay. It, it's, um, the accounting standards have been evolving over the years. And uh, just a few years ago, they wanted us to show expenses in the revolving funds rather than the revolving funds just shifting money over to support. So we've, we're moving towards that. So is the idea being that you're showing costs related to actually offering choice? Is that some correlation there? There's some, some correlation. Um, I, I think it's so you can more easily see that it's not being, being used for other departments or being used for things like uh, buildings, uh, you know, building projects, capital You're plans. To do that? Can't do capital plans. Mm, okay. um, or frowned upon. I think you probably, well, anyway. Um, but they want to see that uh, it's paying for instructional uh, and, and, and the operations of the schools that okay. these kids are coming to. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions on the expense side? Again, these are going to change. Don't get too attached to them. This is just getting a sense of where the, how the, the land lays, okay? So then the question is, if it's going up that much, what happens to assessments? So I have to make some assumptions about assessments to get to that part, and I have to assume what are the other pieces of revenue. So I'm assuming and this is the leftmost column with the yellow heading top that says Chapter 70, 0.8%, 9%, excuse me. Um, I'm assuming that transportation reimbursement is going to be the same as we budgeted for FY13. Um, we're going to get more guidance on that. That number could go up a little bit. I don't know. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement, fairly solid. That's pretty much what you bring in on a year-over-year -year basis. Charter reimbursement, 114, um, really is squishy because I don't have this year's numbers, so I can't really project next year's numbers. It's just, it's just rolling last year's numbers forward two years, so it doesn't really mean much. Um, in interest revenue is probably what we'll look at. And I've, in this version, um, put in using $600,000 from E&D to support the budget. This, this year we're using 633. We had hoped that next year we would be able to reduce that to 400,000. Um, on the other hand, E&D is closing out for this last year healthier than I expected. Okay, because we had a little bit of extra Chapter 70 coming at the end. Um, and it helped. So we could do that. And there's the contingencies in there as usual, the 280. So from those other sources, um, 
It's an increase of 9,000 over current year. Now you can say, well, why are you projecting 0.9% increase in Chapter 70? Last week we heard about nine C cuts. And so I go around on that and I'm thinking, well, maybe I should take that down to 0%. Maybe I should be more optimistic and go to 1.5%. And I finally decide, just leave it where it is. So that, that's a swing there of maybe 80,000 one way or the, or the other. It's, again, one of those variables that we'll get more comfortable with as we go along. Okay. That we'll actually get comfortable with in January, a little more, when the governor comes out with his first budget proposal. It's not the last, but he's the first official word we would get. So looking at all of this, um, you can see that in the blue is the increase of 1.35 million um, for a total budget of 29.8, like on the front. And then the question is, what, what can we support if given all these other revenue assumptions, we assume that the assessments to member towns goes up on the whole 3.5%. Okay, and if I do that, then the gap is that 719,000 you see at the top there in yellow. And if you go over one to the right, the very bottom you see I'm driving now to what happens if the assessment to member towns as a whole increases 2.5% rather than 3.5%. Now you see that the gap is 897,000. And then far right corner, what if the assessment to member towns goes up 1.5%, then the gap would be 1,075,000. Now, because the enrollment average over five years for the member towns is changing, they're all shifting around, not all town assessments rise at the same rate. And what's happening now, nowadays, Leverett is going up faster than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And Amherst is going up slower than anybody else. If you go back to FY09, you see, or even FY10, you see it's quite different because of the changing five-year rolling average of how we will allocate assessments. Mm -hmm. So that's more information to think about as you go forward. Marie alluded to that. Okay, so we can look at our budgets and we can look at our projections and then we have to factor in, okay, so what can our member towns afford and where do we find that balance between what towns can afford and what we need to run the schools and all that. And that's where the big discussion, first big discussion happens in <coughs> January. So I'll be happy to take questions on this part. Trevor? The rolling average leverage does this differently? No. no. Um, to, to make the, to <coughs> allocate assessments for any year, mm -hmm. we take, um, the average, five, the, okay, the average enrollment over the past five years for each member town, mm -hmm. and then find out what percentage, you know, how that how that falls. So as it's moving over the years, and I wish I had a picture uh, with me, uh, we put in a budget book each year. Uh, you can see that um, some towns in average five-year enrollment goes up, and other towns average five-year enrollment goes down. Sometimes they're both going down, but one's going down faster than the other. So the proportion of how we allocate is going to change. Gotcha. Yeah. And at the four town meeting, you'll you'll speak a little bit about the diff two different methods. That's right. The statutory method yeah. or five year and or the alternate. Right. Now, uh, and that way. Yeah, that I think that's what I'm alluding to. Yeah. The, the two different methods. I, yeah. I, I don't remember which town Correct. it is, but use a different method in figuring out what the state would reimburse for their chapter 70. Am I yeah. saying that right? Well, um, can I jump yeah, in? Please. So yeah. um, the four towns determine which method, and then they all use the same method. Mm -hmm. So it's been determined that it's the five-year rolling average, which is easier to budget for because it's less of this for towns. They can have a, a greater sense over time kind of what they're budgeting so that it makes it easier. I mean, I, that's my very short answer, but 
You guys and every, can every year we in. have to vote to approve it. So yes. there's the state formula, yeah. which is more difficult to manage for the towns. And so we right. collectively came together, I don't know, ten, five years ago, something like that, yeah. Yeah. and agreed to do this alternate method that works for us collectively. But okay. every year we have to vote right. not to do the state method. Mm -hmm. I've heard budget. about these two different methods, yeah. but I had to mm -hmm. make sure I understand where it fits in. Yeah. Yeah. This changing it from the way the state normally does. <coughs> yeah. right. Thank you. And if we don't agree, we have to default to the state method. Okay. True. Yes. Towns don't agree. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. <coughs> but that would be pretty extreme. Uh, right. All all the towns mm -hmm. have looked at what it looks like, mm -hmm. and clearly, the alternate method that we use is more advantageous to our continued mm -hmm. stability and health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But every year, I show both calculations mm -hmm. so we can you know, once again see why we do it the way we do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that'll be at our next, uh, at our first four town meeting. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Show yeah. that. So that'll help. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, Michael. I have a budget question that's not related to this. So, I'll wait till you finish. And then ask well, just to finish on this yeah, is yeah. stay tuned because tomorrow, actually by Friday, I know that this will be different because by Friday I will have either choice or charter numbers. Mm -hmm. So, stay tuned. This is a work in progress. It's early on. Um, but we're not going to be adding a lot of stuff. We may have to be cutting back on some stuff as the message tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, so this is an FY13 question. Um, so with the 9C cuts, my understanding, and I just didn't have time to research this, but mm -hmm. my understanding is the last year, I think it was last year, Stan got a law passed that tied regional transportation to Chapter 70. Mm -hmm. And somewhere I mm -hmm. got the sense that regional transportation got cut more than Chapter 70, so I guess it's a two-part. Is that true, and what, what's happening to the region? My understanding is Chapter 70 <laughs> did not get cut. That regional transportation got cut 2%. Okay. Um, so um, the word from Desi is that <laughs> instead of getting 60%, we might get 58% reimbursement. And is that allowable? Is that legal? See, I'm well, tell you, tell you what. Let them figure it out. Does it impact us? No. Why? I don't believe them. So I <laughs> undercut a bit. So even if they cut us 2%, I'm still going to be 1% or 2% on the good side. Okay. So we're okay. And the same thing right. with McKinney-Vento. McKinney-Vento, mm -hmm. uh, we were looking at getting 24000 If they cut it in half, we only get 12000 I'll work it out. This is how you uh, survive in your job. You don't get worked up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you, you hear the big stories, and then you wait for Desi to come out and say, how's it going to play? How's it going to play? Circuit breaker. They cut circuit breaker. Desi says, yeah, they cut circuit breaker, but we have really kind of more than we needed, so I don't think it's going to affect us. We're still going to do 70%. Okay? So there's what the cut is, and then there's how it plays on the ground. Okay. And it's not... I'm not losing any sleep over it. I and neither it. should you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of lobbying happens right now. So the superintendents, I'm watching their list serve go around the Chapter 70 yeah. and the regional transportation. So they kind of battle some things out, and then yeah. we see where it falls. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Rob, if I may, just one um, concluding question, I guess. Um, despite the... Um, nature of the numbers and their unreality, if you will, um, you would still recommend that those of us, particularly in Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury, share these numbers just as a where we are right now yeah. yes. with our select boards and finance committee? Yep. Okay. These are as solid as I can get them to be right. as of today. Okay. Um, and they point to kind of where we're, the general area we're going to end up in. Okay. And clearly, especially because of the shifts in allocations to the assessments, a couple of towns are going to be wanting to think about mm -hmm. what we're going to do about that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll have a lot more information for you very soon. You know, the next meeting there'll be a, hopefully some updated numbers um, and also some preliminary um, ads and cuts. Mm -hmm. Okay? Great Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, moving on to the next item, you should have in your packet um, materials related to several high school course proposals. I'm going to ask Maria to provide the introduction. Actually, I think we have people here to pro provide this. So I don't know, how, how would the high school like to address the course proposals? 
I think we have, our, they're all coming we have up. our faculty here. <laughs> Who, it's wonderful that you get to meet these incredibly talented teachers. Sorry to put you on the spot. So we, we'd like to start with the art history proposal. Yes. Right. Yes. Look oh. at the talent. Oh, okay. I wish. I, oh, Jerry's going to turn it on. Right. So just I'm going to get a, provide a brief frame and then get out of the way. So I think everybody is aware <laughs> of um, the depth of opportunity for kids to create art at the high school. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right pick your medium and there's skilled people to provide kids an opportunity to be incredibly creative. Mm -hmm. And so what today represents is the intersection of an identified need and existing capacity. So the need is to round out the art department's emphasis on creation with mm -hmm. study of history. Mm -hmm. Right? And in the person of Jeff Stoutard, who you'll hear from in a second, we have somebody uniquely qualified mm -hmm. to do that very thing. So we've played with this for a while. Right? And I want to make a distinction clear that we're looking for your authorization to put this course in our program of studies. We're not quite sure when we would offer it. Mm -hmm. We're looking for authorization mm -hmm. too. So I just I want to be clear, we may decide not to run that this year, but it, the time has arrived for it to get in our program of studies. So this is Hannah Hartle, the head of our art department, and she'll start, but then the main event is Mr. Soudard. Okay? Well, since we have that up there. Why don't we start with our yeah, All right. So I'll come back and start, talk more about printmaking afterwards. Um, but we've noticed that it is uh, a gap that we're missing mm -hmm. and that it's a piece that students either design in their independent studies and propose, can I study, study art history, and here's my, they, they write the curriculum and they mm -hmm. do this whole proposal, and it's not quite right, you know, it's mm -hmm. lacking. And there's enough interest that we really feel like this is, it's needed, it's and it's, it's time, yeah. Um, so Jeff has designed the whole curriculum. I'm going to let him go, and I'm going to come back and talk about printmaking after. Great. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be back. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> I have slides like any good art history class. You know, we're going to be looking <laughs> at stuff. Um, hopefully, the class will be really energetic, fun, exciting, and not that dry art history class that some people might have had. You know, I've had a lot of different ones, and I have an idea of how uh, I want it to be so that it has a lasting impact for kids, that they really sticks with them, that gets them excited because it's a passion of mine and I hope to share that and spread that. And, and so um, what I basically, this is very few slides because I know we're going to run right through it, but just to give you an idea of kind of the objectives for the course, what do we want students to know? Uh, it is a chronological survey of global artistic production. So we've got 12 weeks and 27,000 years, probably start Stone Age, <laughs> six continents, so no problem. Uh, and really, uh, with this introductory slide, uh, I would say that we really want to teach students to understand works with a, both a visual and contextual analysis, and that's pretty consistent with art history courses today. The old way was the visual analysis and uh, contextual analysis now, you know, side by side, and we'll explain what those are in a moment. In terms of visual analysis, that would be students learning to analyze, write, talk about artworks using descriptive language uh, that identifies formal characteristics. We do a lot of this in studio classes. So if we get kids who've had studio classes, they're going to know how to talk about line, shape, form, rhythm. With this Matisse painting, we would definitely talk about space and the flattening out of the picture plane that happens in modernism. So I have illustrations to quickly show you. <laughs> kind of uh, what we mean by the objectives. Uh, works of art will be considered with respect to the role of the artist and to the societal function of the artwork. I think a lot of our students are under the uh, impression maybe that artwork is always, you go to a museum and there and hushed and calcified, there is some artwork that you're supposed to, you know, there's a, there's a removal between the student and the artwork. And to show that art's really produced by many different artists for many different reasons. In, in the case of this Ife head bust, there's a ceremonial role. It's part of, uh, from what we know about it, because this is a medieval piece, uh, part of patronage rights and all this stuff. So that it works function in different ways. Um, students will learn about methods, materials, and techniques used by artists and architects. So for instance, uh, this is a fresco. We talk about fresco versus oil. Uh, and major developments in art history the invention of linear perspective, which happened shortly before this, which unlike the Matisse, allows us to see really deep uh, space. Uh, and you can see those orthogonals going back there, if you know what those are. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, students will learn to understand artworks within their historical context. So this is the other side rather than the visual, um, the contextual art history, including issues of religion, gender, patronage, power, ethnicity, culture, uh, and really looking at pictures not just, you know, it's a pink dress, it's a blue sky. There's a lot more going on here that kids are prepared to talk about and, um, and think about in a sophisticated way and knowing more about this, knowing that Frida is half Mexican, half German, knowing that she painted this while she lived in the United States and she was really homesick and seeing the, um, the pre-Columbian architecture and artifacts on the one side and then this industrialized 1930s, right? This industrialized United States on the other side. So those kinds of issues will definitely be a big part of the class. Students will learn to recognize works of art as belonging to styles and periods. Uh, and to understand the link between historical events and artistic production. So this is a historic event, you know, not a major one in the history books, um, but a big one in Spain in 1814, because it's only a few years away, civilians executed by Napoleonic troops. And but what we talk about various styles and periods, this is really romanticism. So we want students to know when they leave the class, you know, Goya is a romantic painter. Romanticism has loose brushwork. Uh, high contrast between lights and darks and this subject matter that's supposed to get you outraged and inflamed in this case or whatever strong emotion right as opposed to like stoic neoclassical painting which we'll also look at uh, I think when you leave you should be able to identify really important artwork so we will have the dreaded slide IDs I think they're fun you know so <laughs> but you never forget them and then you know these things for the rest of your life so if you know that that's uh, the Taj Mahal for the rest of your life, and it's not the Hagia Sophia, and you can know the difference, and you know, these are good things to know. And <coughs> lastly, it is a really fast overview, but I think students can gain an appreciation uh, for art and art history, and go to museums and be informed consumers of art, and not, you know, have no basis of understanding what you're seeing. If that's all that a student gets from this, that would make me totally happy, you know. Uh, for other students who are, are find that passion, you know, go on to college, study all different areas of art, art history, history, and, um, and enjoy it. So those are my slides, but I'm happy to take questions too. If you're handing out a test? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, you, gotta, you gotta remember all this. I just wanna make the comment that I really wanna take the course. I'm yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like I amazing, take it too. so thank you. Thank you. Questions? questions. Um, I, I have one, I'm not sure whether I should address it to you or mm -hmm. to Mark. Um, some of the things that Maria has talked about in terms of just some of the reforms, if I can use mm -hmm. that word, um, caused me to ask this question. Is there any likelihood in the next year or two that conversations would take place with the social studies department, say, mm -hmm. for some kind of team or, you know, multidiscipline approach to, to art mm -hmm. and, and also, um, perhaps receive dual credit in both art and social studies, is that? Likely? Yeah, we've had students actually ask when they hear about this, about what kind of credit is it, and I don't totally understand. I stay in the art room most of the time. So, but I think Mickey is maybe, these are ongoing discussions. I certainly want to touch base with some teachers um, and, and in the social studies department and talk about, you know, where's the crossover, where's the gap, and, and that kind of thing. That bear pick you out. Uh, I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works. <laughs> it's good to say that. So I hate when you ask me those questions, keep in public, right? So is there a plan <laughs> to explore the intersection between <laughs> those two disciplines right now? Currently, Thank there's you. there's not, right? There's a kind of a exploding with the possibility to yes. to yes. go down the road. There is, and so when you open your mouth, I watch these heads go like this, uh, yeah, right? And so it would be on their back that they, we we would leverage okay. that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. With, with yeah, with yeah. all the talks of like budget cuts and stuff, it's hard to come after that. So how do we pay for this if we like it? How does that work? It is the same. So it. we are hiring a new nope. teacher. So it's it would be him. one of us. We would, it would be, we would, rem yep. move, right now the plan would be and for next year. Yes. Yeah. Start over again. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the plan would be that next year Jeff would teach one less class, one less foundations class. Okay. So there wouldn't be any hiring. There is the cost of textbooks, you know, of the book mm -hmm. that we've um, been looking at. So that's the only cost. Okay, thanks. So, so it's within the scheduling structure. It's not additional right. staffing. True. Just see how I said that again for you, Mark. 
So no one can deny, of course, the, uh, uh, I'm an art connoisseur, no one can deny the, um, the, the, the value, even though it's not um, um, tangible, mm -hmm. of understanding art history. But my question is, what is the, um, the downside of this? If there's one less uh, uh, general art course taught, how does that affect our student population? What is the downside of this? Everybody can imagine, oh, it would be great if all of our children could recognize the Guggenheim immediately. Yeah. But who is that hurting? I mean, I think it is about filling a gap in the curriculum. <laughs> yeah, so what we do in terms of elective courses is we approach them all based on student requests. Mm -hmm. And so um, could it play out eventually that we have just as many students taking the art classes as we have signing up for the art history? Yeah, so um, could that result in an ad? But there's only a finite number of kids asking for a finite number of electives, so it's usually a give and take. So. Mm -hmm. Today, there's empty seats in some of the art classes. You know, just that's how high schools operate. And so maybe there would be um, larger, some larger class sizes there to be able to make room for the art history. But we're, we're not, we wouldn't be bringing this forward if we thought that it would be some kind of big budget ad. But that's the process is we wait until the course requests come in and then we make decisions from there. But, but the important thing is that the art classes are not filled up now. That's not right. all of them. All, we're not at capacity in every single elective course, and that is a typical that is a typical scenario. Right. And so it's a it's a give and take. So the, the students who take that course are not taking something else, mm -hmm. and so that's just how we do scheduling every year. Um, but we want to start by limiting it to maybe one or two sections. But again, we want to see how many students sign up for the course and take a look at at how it plays out. Are they electing that instead of uh, like their third or fourth? other art class you, you know what I'm saying so so a lot of times it's going to be a wash in the department but this is great because there could be lots of kids who don't take our traditional art classes so to speak who, who are going to be very interested in this mm -hmm. so this will this will be interesting how it plays out Thank you. any other questions I have just one more if I may um, in your judgment um, how would the course change if it were offered in an 18 week semester block of time I think you'd have more time to uh, present the material. Now, I don't know how the master schedule would be different in terms no, of classroom content hours. Of, content of the course. The content of the course wouldn't be dramatically different. I think I can, I can, think I can bring us over the finish line and, and go from you know, the Stone Age to contemporary art. That's how I mapped it out. And it's, it is a cursory you know, run through to give kids just a sense and some general knowledge of all these nothing will be really in depth but that's true of a survey course mm -hmm. at an undergraduate college level as well so what about, what about a student assessments uh, th there's going to be testing there's going to be Maybe reading 18 weeks as opposed to 12 um, I wouldn't see it as dramatically different. You might have time for more research-based stuff um, or maybe a couple of assignments like that and I'm still working through you know I'm going through my mind of all the different ways um, that I want to structure the course. So nothing's really completely set, even now as the 12 week course. So, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Do you want to wait on the votes until the end? Is that fair for people? Um, Do you want to wait? Well, well, you want to vote on printmaking and the, the uh, health class, all of them, all together? Yeah. Or if you want to do it one by one? Or how do you you want to present them all? I just wanted approval. I don't care. For all three, though. <laughs> <laughs> For all three. So we'll wait till the end. I'll leave them up to you. Okay. 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 I'm going I'm to ask the committee, unless there are objections, to wait until the end. We'll vote on all three, unless there are any objections. Yeah. Not hearing any, we'll go with all Great. three. Go ahead. Um, one more note on that um, course is that there will be an honors and a PC version of it happening simultaneously. So that if there are kids who want to go into mm. more depth, they'll have that option to, to do so. How exactly that will play out? It'll be more reading. It'll be more writing. It'll be, you know, they'll all be doing the same tests, but that probably they're reading and they're writing. But yeah. can I ask a question about sure. that? Yeah. Uh, will the heterogeneous nature of the student body actually make it easier to schedule? Thank you. Other questions? So the second course that we'd like to propose is an advanced printmaking class that would take place simultaneously in the printmaking class that's, that now exists. So it's not, there's no change in that as well. They would be doing the same, um, using the same, same materials, but it'd be expected to take it to a higher level mm -hmm. and create a, um, you know, an addition as opposed to you know, some more of a, a printing portfolio as opposed to just finishing all the assignments. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that would be also be taught by Ben Sears, this, who's the printmaking teacher now. Um, and and that, the reason for that is that there are the same, there's the same problem. They have students who design, you know, these are Alps's the independent studies. They present us with their plan and what, it, what they'd like to do in the future. And it's just screaming out the number of them that propose an independent study in advanced printmaking just says we need to have them in here, have a class, and have it led. In a, you know, as opposed to them trying to dream up what they would do, the ne what's the next step. Um, it really just is begging to have that also. Questions about the printmaking? Yeah. So just scheduling wise, so it sounds like so student A would one year take printmaking, and then next year they base the same student would be enrolled in the same class, but be expected to do different work at a different level. They right, and they, and they would sign up for advanced printmaking. Yeah. But yes, it would happen at right. the same time, and right, and the curriculum they would. The write-up is would be, is different um, for advanced printmaking. So there, but it's the very same clear. Space, same teacher, same, same space, same material, same printer. But yeah, got it. Cool. Um, but they would have the write-up of exactly what would be expected of them, and knowing that it's higher. Yeah. Thank you very Questions? much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Phys Ed. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, so we're proposing a shift in, in the current alignment of our uh, our ninth grade phys physical education course, which is called Adventure Challenge, um, and our tenth grade health class. Both courses that um, are required um, for for all of our students to take while they're in high school. Um, so, what we'd like to see is is in FY14 that we in in ninth grade um, all the students take the health class. And um, all the 10th graders next year would also take the health class because they wouldn't have gotten it this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then the following year, we would have both classes offered at that point in time. Um, and, and the most compelling reason to do this is that the topics covered in the health curriculum mm -hmm. um, are really ones that we would like to see taught at the beginning of high school right. um, and not potentially to somebody who's going to almost be a junior. Um, so I think that's the most compelling reason. Also, though, the Adventure Challenge curriculum, I think, is geared a little bit more towards, you know, a slightly older student um, where they're getting into a lot of team building and getting into um, um, climbing at the end of that unit. So I think it makes sense there as well. But I think the health is the real, mm -hmm. um, is the real important change. Uh, and all of our um, PE and health teachers are, are uh, fully behind this uh, transition. So it would mean that next year um, we would end up teaching mostly health courses and mm -hmm. there would be a few uh, PE elective courses available but there would be you know we wouldn't be teaching that adventure challenge curriculum um, yeah so questions, questions? Michael um, just a, I think it's a good idea just mm -hmm. in terms of the transition is there any budgetary stuff in terms of the taking a bunch now and then yeah there sh with? there shouldn't be we are gonna have um, uh, one teacher potentially, or one teacher is going to be retiring next year as a health teacher, so we would uh, theoretically hire somebody who was trained in health, um, and then that would actually give us the following year to have some of that, have that person trained in the Adventure Challenge curriculum. Um, we'll be a lot more likely to find somebody who's got the health certification than the Adventure Challenge. Um, so it could actually be a, a helpful thing. Um, but no, it shouldn't impact, it shouldn't increase any, anything in terms Thanks. of the budget. Anything else from the committee? Thank you very much. I will entertain a motion to authorize the placement of the art history, advanced printmaking, and for lack of a better term, I guess the realignment of ninth and tenth grade resequencing of ninth and tenth grade physical education and health. So moved. Second. Second. Seconded by Lawrence. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you, thank you. And um, we won't be offended if you run out <laughs> <laughs> at all. You were just here for our votes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Mr. so Farrow, much. You are you staying home, <laughs> right? <so> yes. <laughs> uh, I would hope so. Kathy's going to do the school choice. Right. Kathy. So we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit about school choice. We mm -hmm. have to have a discussion, and Kathy mm -hmm. would like to share some information.
entertain questions. I've provided you with the inventory of choice students, if you will, in the current year at the regional level. There's 94 students. Um, you can see the grade uh, distribution number of students by grade. I've also provided um, the distribution by our area towns. I do think it's interesting to note, I went on the DESE website and looked at the Hadley number, which of course is 35, and that represents about 12% of their mm -hmm. 7 through 12 population, um, which is pretty significant, I, would th I think. Um, and just some historical information about uh, the beginning of choice in our district, very controversial back in 1999 when it started, very split vote as I recall. Um, and that over 1,200 students have passed through our, our um, school cho through our schools via choice at this point. And um, we have very robust interest every year from our communities and families from our surrounding towns, and um, we hope to continue to do so. About next year, however, I think given the um, uncertainty of the budget at this point and what recommendations our principals will be making about um, the possibility of constriction, if you will. Um, I think we should wait uh, for a month or so before I come back to you and recommend opening slots, particularly in grade seven. Of course, anyone enrolled now will remain, uh, but whether we'll open in grade seven or additional slots in other grades, I think we should wait a little bit longer before we decide to do that. Yeah, um, question on that note, um, on our calendar, the school vote choice at the regional level is on the 8th of January. Are you suggesting that we should postpone that? Yes, I believe we should. Uh, um, I'm going to guess, um, and I would like a little bit more solid information about our budget, so I would wait uh, as long as possibly another month beyond that 12, before 12 deciding. February. Yep, that okay. would be great. Okay. Um, Michael. This is just sort of a curiosity question, but for the kids coming from, I guess, just Shutesburg and Leverett, yes. who choiced into those districts, do you know who how many there are? Do you track that, or do they just sort of show up and say? I do track that. I don't. I'm afraid I don't have those numbers with me. I I recall that. Um, we don't have any, so you don't have any. But um, I think Leverett actually has quite a large number of yeah. choice mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. as does Pelham at this time, and it is kind of hard to predict for me when I'm I'm looking and looking at the history of where those kids are coming from and whether or not they will actually enter our district. They're entitled to. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're entitled to matriculate from grade six to grade seven if they're choiced in presently to Pelham, Leverett, or Shutesbury. Okay. But whether they actually come is another question. That information is available. Though. Yes. yes. Is, can you provide that maybe in an email or something? Sure. I'd like Absolutely. to see how many yeah. actually continue on yeah. to seventh grade. That I'd would be, be happy helpful to. information. Yep. Yes, right. For me, on cho <coughs> choice, the bottom line is always looking, trying to look at, is this a plus or a negative to the budget? So if you remove the revenue of choice and removed associated expenses for those mm -hmm. kids, is that a plus or a minus? Um, so I wonder if we could always kind of try to look right, at that yeah. and figure that out. Well, we don't try to, to, we don't accept school choice kids with the idea that we're increasing our expenses. Um, Mickey Gramacki would refer to these as seats, available seats, which is why I am holding off for now. I want to make sure that we're not um, e keeping a budget in place that is expansive, requiring choice. I want, I want to be able to backfill, if you will, the seats that are available and then offer those as choice slots. So the intent is not to expand using this. So I, I totally agree with that, and I think mm -hmm. a use of choice is a good use of choice is to fill unused mm -hmm. capacity. Correct. Mm -hmm. But if you get too far right. up there, mm -hmm. you could find that you could cut back one whole, you know, level of capacity. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so you yeah. just got to be careful. I think here. we've been careful. At the most, I think at any <clears throat> one year we had 120 students um, in total, 7 through 12 at the region. And I think we've been careful and cautious. We've cut back and expanded uh, as we've been able to. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. yeah. Michael. Um, just since this was a, a discussion, I had a, a, a question. Traditionally, I've been against it in Shutesbury. I sort of feel like I'm mm -hmm. a little bit different seat at the region. <laughs> but would you mind, because I know wherever it's active, we've been debating, you know, sort of a change. And so it seems like it'd be healthy in, in this context to share the leverage. <laughs> That's well, put you I, on I the spot. I against it from the get-go. I'm still against it uh, for many reasons. Um, 
and as far from my perspective, very subjectively, the, the proverbial chickens have come home to roost because what was at one point <coughs> supplement or, or complementary revenue has become so integral to our budget that it's now part of our operational budget. It's, it's essential that we keep that money. Otherwise, we would need to make significant cuts. Um, to a certain degree, it's also performed the role of insurance policy when unexpected circumstances have come up. But right now, I would say it's the drug has taken hold of the body. And that's unfortunate as far as I'm concerned. So, Maria, would you, or, yeah, is, what's your take on the region in terms of that? I wouldn't portray it the same way in region because, <laughs> no, honestly, and I mean this honestly, I would, I would portray it similarly in Pelham. But yes. it's a very right. different. Um, it's a different animal. It's a very different animal. I think that's a great way to say it. And it's a tough call for the small schools, depending on their enrollment. And if you have declining enrollment, it is for some people being caught between a rock and a hard place. In the region, it is the opportunity to bring in additional revenue to, to round out seats versus we're not adding staff to accommodate students. So it is it is different for us as I see it. I, I would also add, if I may, that. Yeah, it's also a very important piece of a much larger conversation mm -hmm. about regionalization yeah. because at root here what we're talking about is not school choice but sustain financial sustainability mm -hmm. and that's ultimately exactly. more critical than school choice. School choice is yes. merely a piece of that very la much larger conversation. So part of um, what I think needs to be considered in any discussion, any honest discussion of regionalization mm -hmm. is financial sustainability <coughs> of which school choice is a piece. <coughs> I thoroughly agree. Trevor. I, I thoroughly agree with that too, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to agree with the superintendent that it is a different animal mm -hmm. in the um, elementary school, especially in the small towns where, yes. uh, uh, to, par uh, to borrow your phrase, the drug is taking over, whereas in the region, uh, it could be seen as the drug is, could be beneficial. If mm -hmm. there was regionalization, the question arises, which one of those two scenarios works for the entire region? Would this cause the entire region to have, be dependent on school choice, or would this cause the entire region to now be inoculated against the bad effects of school exactly. choice? And that's what we've hired these consultants to tell us, you know, how this might shake out. Mm -hmm. Catherine, mm -hmm. very yeah, I just want to offer the one other piece to school choice that I think, you know, we have the advantage of, I guess, um, in Amherst, which is, that one of the one of the reasons I voted for school choice at the elementary level um, is because it allows us to fill out seats um, and maintain smaller class sizes. So, you know, it just it makes that um, both uh, it makes that easier to do, so that we are not necessarily. So, if we had an elementary school class of fourteen and we wanted to bring it to eighteen as opposed to having two large classes of, you know, 25, we do that. And I see school choice as a real um, advantage in that way. Um, so something to think about also and as we think about regionalization. And, and I think at the secondary level, you know, when I hear about some empty art classes or um, this fantastic art history possibility mm -hmm. and um, you know you you want to fill out those classes and not have to cut them because you don't have enough kids mm -hmm. and I do recognize the challenge for communities in this discussion and I think we all can sit and say oh, on one hand I, I dislike it on the other hand you know it, it does work for the system and I do think in Amherst, what we have been able to do at the elementary level is to have more equitable class sizes across schools, which has been really beneficial so that we don't see such disparity. Right. Um, we've been able to kind of round out of, of what do we want our class size to be at each level. So cost and benefits. And just one more piece of information for the committee. At last night's Franklin County School Committee caucus meeting, there was discussion of there is a representative who, forgive me, but whose name I can't recall, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> who is very seriously considering submitting legislation to significantly modify school choice. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need to keep an eye on that process as it moves forward. Nothing's been submitted, <coughs> yet, but apparently she's planning on doing it. So. Um, 
Between yes. now and February, do you anticipate having any additional information that you would share with us in the interim? Yes, I will have additional information. Okay. I think largely that pertains to what our gap is and how we're going to manage it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, athletic sponsorships. Rick? Okay, so before I get started in here, I'd like to uh, thank the members of the sponsorship committee who have been working with me over the course of the past year at this point, um, throughout sort of the infancy of this um, this program up until this point, and will continue to help me into the future. Um, so Pete Sylvan, uh, Trip Peak are not able to be here this this evening. Roy Johnson is here, um, representing representing the group. Um, Karen Dunn and Dave Noonan, um, who's out and watching his son play hockey right now. So um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to them because they've mm -hmm. spent hours and hours. Um, and in this particular project, especially Trip Peak, um, has really spent a lot of time uh, working with me on this. So just a, a real quick brief history in terms of, of where we've come from. Um, so this is just a, a slide that looks a little bit at how appropriations have decreased within uh, the athletics from 2007 to 2012. Um, so you can see a, a, a dramatic decrease, you know, from 408 down to 234 uh, last year. And our revolving has increased over that period of time to help make up some of that um, reduction in the appropriations, and that's come mostly within our fee increases that we've had. Um, which brings us back a little bit to, to our last discussion. Um, and you can see our, our current budget is actually slightly less right now than it was um, five years ago. So in, in terms of that, for this year, uh, we had this response. And this is what we actually have put into place for FY13. Uh, so last spring, the superintendent um, agreed to, to a $25,000 add to appropriations which has helped us uh, cover more of our coaches' salaries. Um, we're still not covering all of our coaches' salaries with appropriations, but, but um, we're at about probably um, two-thirds at this point. Uh, we also had the 7% increase in fees, which amounted to around $12,000, uh, assuming we had similar numbers of students participating in athletics, and it looks like that's the case so far this year. Um, and then we had some reductions, so we get into transportation, had a $10,000 um, reduction in, in transportation. And I've been able to do that mostly by shifting some of the times of, of our um, times and days that we actually have our athletic events and utilize our, our town transportation versus Five Star, which is our private contractor. Uh, our officials as well. Um, last year, we'd actually budgeted for an increase in our officials, but they actually are on uh, a four-year cycle in terms of how much they get paid so we didn't actually end up with any sort of an increase this year in uh, officiating costs um, inside of our coaching uh, we were we did make some reductions within our coaching staff um, there were a couple of uh, assistant coach positions that were eliminated um, and then we also had um, and we've actually had um, one places in within our football program we eliminated assistant coaching position but we ended up with um, six individuals who all agreed to split um, two assistant coach salaries this year. So our assistant football coaches um, came out and, you know, they didn't do it for free, but, but pretty much at this point. <laughs> but just the, the, they felt, you know, the respect of at least having somewhat of a salary. Um, they really appreciated that. So I just wanted to recognize what they did this fall. Um, and then our ice time rental and working with Amherst College, they were willing to drop that down uh, $2,000 as well. And so that'll come into play this year and um, hopefully into the future. Uh, one of the other pieces that we did is we set some participation minimums for a couple of our sports. Uh, hockey was one of them. Um, we set a minimum of 16, and we're actually at uh, 22 this year. So our hockey numbers have increased, which is great. Um, they just beat Central tonight, 5-1. to one. Uh, Congratulations. Wrestling on the other side of this is um, – is something that we were not able to offer this winter. So we set a minimum of 16 wrestlers as well, uh, which is actually less than what the, the PVIAC suggests for wrestling. Uh, and we actually only had five students come out for wrestling this year. Um, so we did not cut the program. We're not offering it this year. 
Um, we're going to be doing some work to uh, see what we can do potentially at the middle school, even maybe this winter, to, to do something to try and um, to get some kids interested in wrestling again, and then next fall as well. So hopefully we can uh, bring those numbers back up because um, we've had a, actually a very successful wrestling program this, um, in 2004. They actually won Western Mass, so it wasn't too long ago that we had a successful program. Um, but we did stick to those minimums that we said we were going to um, and, and did not offer wrestling this year. Um, and then the last piece of this is increasing our revenues through the sponsorship program, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. So before we get to that, one of the things that we've talked about several times over the past um, 10 months mm -hmm. are the, the booster contributions to our budget. Um, and I finally had the time to sit down and break out some of these numbers, which is something that you had asked for, um, I think, last spring. So I'll do a little explaining about how this works. So we have what's called um, individual sport booster clubs. So that's like the ice hockey team has a booster club. The football team has a booster club. Um, and we have somewhere around 15 active booster clubs at this point in time. And they all hold student activities accounts here at the school. Um, and they raise money through various means, bake sales. Um, you've seen the, probably the soccer kids in the center of town collecting money, um, going out in front of the stores, doing different, different types of fundraisers. Um, and then we have our, our larger hurricane booster group. And that's um, a group that is, at this point in time, run by most of the people who are on the sponsorship committee. But what we try and do is we try and get a couple representatives parent guardian representatives from each of our athletic teams. And so at this point, I think at our last meeting, we had you know 20 plus people there. Um, some of the same people who were involved in the in individual team boosters. Um, but the programs that this group runs are the big things like Monte Carlo night. Um, and then they do a, a golf tournament in the summertime. So they're, they're kind of a bigger organization, bigger events. Um, and then when you get into what what that money is actually used for, um, it's a little different as well. So our individual booster groups are paying for, at this point in time, um, bats, balls, uniforms, essential items for our teams. Um, they also put money towards food for the kids for bus trips and things like that. But in terms of the numbers that I have up in here, um, in FY11 you see the $44,600. That was money that the individual booster these 15 or so individual booster groups raised and spent on equipment, things that are essential to the sports, okay? Not food, not, not things of, of that sort, um, not the banquets, that's all separate. So they actually raised even more money for, in addition, you know, for those things. Um, the larger hurricane booster group, um, they tend to donate, uh, they collect money, they donate sort of larger ticket items um, and like the scoreboards that we've got for, for softball. And we got just a, recently a small um, portable scoreboard that we can use for our girls lacrosse and boys lacrosse and some of the other field sports. So they, they get into the kind of bigger ticket items, the things that um, you wouldn't necessarily say are essential, but they are in a sense. Um, and then a lot of the money that they actually raise through those things like the, the Monte Carlo night does get funneled back into the team accounts as well. Because if a kid goes out and sells a ticket for Monte Carlo, um, they can designate a certain portion of that money to go back to the teams directly. Um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit about our booster groups, the work that they've done, um, and how much they're actually helping to, to keep things going in terms of um, uh, you know, essential day-to-day -day things for our programs. So that gets us into the sponsorship program. So last spring, we came and talked, um, and the school committee said, okay, m move on with the sponsorship program in terms of the banners. Um, so over the past six months, the sponsorship committee, um, has, we've developed a plan of action uh, that we're going to put forth, hopefully starting in the next you know, week or two. Um, and so what that looks like is we got together last week, and we targeted 10 to 15 prospective business businesses in the area to approach with our initial program. And I'll explain a little bit more about the program in a minute. Um, and so the sponsorship committee, uh, the members are going to go out um, to some of these prospective businesses and conduct a little bit of market research and kind of pilot um, our program to see what kind of interest we actually get. 
Um, so we're probably going to go out in pairs. I'll go out with somebody and we'll go talk to, to some of our local businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and then in January, we're gonna, after we've had these discussions and we've had you know, a dozen or so interactions with local businesses, we're going to come back together uh, to analyze and kind of assess what they have to say to us. And they might say, great, we're, we're interested in this. Or they might say, eh, it's, you know, maybe that's a little bit too much. Maybe we want to do something a little bit different. Um, and then we can refine this. Um, and, and, and then what we'd like to do is, once we have our final um, program together, is go out, expand our group by a few more members, and go out on kind of more of a full-scale you know, launch of our campaign in February, um, when we really have, have things um, as together as possible. So just a couple of the, of the highlights of this. Um, so we're being ambitious. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we're looking at sort of total commitment targets, maybe around 25000 a year. We're going to try and um, see if we can get businesses to, to look at maybe three-year commitments to one of our different sponsorship levels. Um, and the different levels, we've, we've called them gold, silver, and bronze. I'm going to show you the, the gold level in a second. Um, and we feel like it's a win-win for, for the local businesses and for, for the athletic depart department here. Um, so, and, and again, we're looking at conducting this in initial feasibility uh, market research over the next you know, couple of weeks, hopefully. So I'll highlight a little bit what this looks like. And this isn't completely finalized yet, but this is an example of what we would be looking for in terms of like the gold sponsorship. Um, and so there are several things that come into this. Um, so you have our full banners, uh, signs in the three locations that we talked about last spring, which are the inside of our gym, um, the fence along our track, um, and our concession stand that's by the, the football field. Um, those are the three places that we agreed upon that we could, we could do at this point in time that are on our property. Um, the other piece of this is a, a full year large banner ad on our digital sports website. Um, how many of you have seen our the digital sports scheduling page? Okay, good. So several people have seen it. Um, so we would take control of those ads that are on there, and we would be able to, to advertise our local businesses right on there. Um, we would look at doing identification thank yous in the newspapers. You know, at the end of each season, we'd play sort of an ad. Did everybody see the, uh, the soccer one that was in the paper mm -hmm. for the soccer team last week? Yeah. So there was a nice full-page ad for the soccer team. So we would do something like that mm -hmm. and list our thank yous to our businesses um, you know, who have been sponsoring us in there. We'd also look to include them in any of our programs that are handed out um, at our athletic events. Um, they would be kind of a co-sponsor of the Monte Carlo night. So we'd be combining this as well with a couple of the things that the larger hurricane group does. So we would do some advertising in terms of probably bringing a banner over for something like Monte Carlo night um, and the hurricane golf open as well. So there would be some other pieces in terms of free tickets and, and golfers for those events. Um, and, then, and then, you know, invites to come... Um, to like we did a coaches appreciation night that the hurricane boosters put on last year so we could recognize them in an event like that as well um, and then some passes to all of our sporting events so that so that looks like what the gold level is at and again we're being ambitious in terms of the amount of money that we're looking at um, but we like to reach high mm -hmm. um, so our gold s starts there our silver goes down to uh, 3,000 and our bronze goes down to 1,000 and it's just a slightly different um, package and we've actually have a couple more ideas that we're thinking about um, including in this so I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of, of what that looks like real quickly I have uh, so I've been talking with a couple of local businesses ar around what these banners would, would look like um, and so Sean Cleary from copycat was actually able to give me one it's not exactly what we're gonna do but just so you have an idea this is an example he gave me to show you guys that he did for the Youth Action Coalition. Mm -hmm. So it's like a you know a high grade material that you can have outside <coughs> with your with your grommets, mm -hmm. okay? and so we could attach it to different surfaces and it's weather resistant, mm -hmm. um, and we could also use it inside the gymnasium. So this is kind of what we're looking at. Slightly different. We're looking at more of a three by five is what we'd be talking about. Um, so uh, that, that's where we're at at this point in time, and I just wanted to, uh, to kind of bring everybody up to speed.
Um, and, and we're looking forward to moving on and actually getting out and starting to talk to some businesses in the next couple of weeks. Great. Thank you. Rick. Yeah. Shabazz. So can you backtrack to the historical slide that mm -hmm. looked at the changes in mm -hmm. the fiscal environment? <coughs> Right, brief history. Yep. So does that capture, that's only to FY12, so that doesn't capture the things in the next slide of the fiscal year 13. Correct. But within this, the athletics director's salary is, is captured as a part of that, or is that separate? Yes, that's part of this. Okay. Yep. Catherine. Um, yeah, thank you, Rich. This mm -hmm. is um, a lot of work, and I... <clears throat> hope it works um, me too um, so but I just had you know as soon as you unrolled the banner I thought um, oh my god what if you know at night it's out in the concession stand graffiti that kind yep. of thing so will it be taken yeah so now? this is something we're talking about in terms of the outdoor spaces and what kind of options we might have in yeah. terms of displaying these um, so I was talking with Sean the other day about like what sort of options like fasteners that would be easy to right. take on and off mm -hmm. um, we have event staff at our night events uh, around you know that we do at alumni field by the right. track so we could just incorporate that into part of our kind of routine for setting up and, and so taking down down, right. um, I'm looking at some other options too because we do have the the lights around the track you know mm -hmm. so I don't know if we can get creative in terms of potentially displaying things a pie that would be out of the way concession stand as well you know we have the ability to potentially do you know we could do something off the concession stand where the banners can be displayed or right. on the sides up top Okay. Um, so it's definitely something we've thought about, yeah. right. um, for sure. I uh, saw so Michael, and then Annie, and then Trevor. Michael, thank you for all the work. Mm -hmm. Sure, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, I actually want to ask, ask a question about that slide as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like with the revolving support, most of it's fees. <coughs> At least that's what you were saying. But I'm wondering what's what's the other stuff that's in there. Uh, so the revolving account is primarily fees, um, but you also have gate receipts in there. So in terms of money that comes in for ticket sales from all our night events. Okay. So we charge um, admission for all of our, um, any of our indoor events. So all of our, I shouldn't say that, all of our basketball games, um, our hockey games. Um, and then during the spring and fall, anytime we have night events on Alumni Field, which is the field inside the track, um, we charge and also for our football games. Okay, uh, but, and mostly the differential is from... Yeah, so the, in terms of the gates, we bring in, the past several years have been right around twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year in, in the gates, um, with most of the remainder of that being um, our, uh, our fees, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Annie? And I was just wondering about, um, when you talked about the banners hanging mm -hmm. in the gym, um, and I thought we talked about it in school committee, not... <coughs> Um, or the question of whether we wanted the advertisements in the gym in the kids' faces all the time mm -hmm. when they're not doing sports, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just wasn't sure if that was something that um, we were policy on yet. We talked about maybe taking them down during physical right. classes. Yeah, I mean, there would always be that possibility to do that. Mm -hmm. Logistically, it would be, you know, one of those things we would deal with. But I don't think that that's been something that's... We haven't talked about Yeah, that, no. it's gone any further at this point. We certainly can, but we haven't. Mm -hmm. um, any, was that, that it? it? Trevor? Similar to Ann, I wanted to um, clarify some of the previous discussions mm -hmm. we had. I remember, um, I think it was Mr. Hood. No, it wasn't Mr. Hood. I think it might have been Mr. Spence describing um, perhaps limiting who we would go to for advertising and I don't want to put words in his mouth I don't remember I remember having a conversation about who you guys would go to for advertising mm -hmm. and trying to make sure it stayed tactful mm -hmm. and I don't think we came to a conclusion on making a policy of that mm -hmm. and now that we're getting closer to it actually happening I just wanted to put to the school board that that was still an open question if you know, we were gonna, what the um, um, logistics of it would be. Would it be we're just accepting everybody brings this? These people said they're willing to put this money up and then we would discuss whether or not we would wanna accept that kind of money or did we give the athletic department carte blanche to find money where I think that was still an open question. Mm -hmm. I, 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 well, the way I remember it is that 
Not that we gave the athletic department carte blanche, but you know, I don't. Sure. I hope we're not going to have Corona ads up yeah, in the gym. There were guidelines in terms right, of right. There were guidelines, yeah. Yeah. and you were going to have yourself and maybe a couple other people, some sort of committee. Mm -hmm. It was going to vet things, mm -hmm. and um, but there were certainly guidelines, as I remember. But it was an administrative yeah, responsibility. It wasn't correct. Right. Yeah. All right. So we did. We did have closure on that mm -hmm. question. Yep. That was what it was. Well, okay. as I remember it. Um, Rick. Um, I wonder if you're looking at going after national companies as well as local, and if that even works. Right. Uh, so, so I, I think that, and that gets back into Trevor's mm -hmm. discussion. So, I think that is one piece of it that, that was we didn't mm -hmm. kind of finalize. We did. You know, we had talked about mm -hmm. local businesses, and yeah. we had talked about what businesses we wouldn't be putting on right. in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, alcohol, tobacco, that sort of that, those sorts of businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we ever actually finalized in terms of going <coughs> beyond you know, businesses in our, our area. I think there was some discussion going Kip, back and forth. do you remember? Excuse me? Do you remember if we finalized that? No, I don't remember. We did not. We no. Did not. no. Um, I think a lot, do you remember follow up? Rick but kind of, yeah. But go ahead. Because I remember a discussion about we wouldn't want to go to <coughs> national companies that compete with local ones, mm -hmm. but I can imagine a lot of ones that don't. Like, like you know, Nike or something. Now, maybe they don't do that, but right. But if they did, it would be great, or companies like that. Mm -hmm. the, the only other thing to throw in, uh, maybe we should go after companies that we buy a lot of stuff from. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Um, I, I think one of the things we should bear in mind in, in, in regards to policy is, particularly given the progress that you've made, which mm -hmm. is incredible, mm -hmm. is that we don't do anything to tie Richard's mm -hmm. hands as he proceeds oh, with yeah. this. I think we have to trust that before you do anything that in your collective judgment mm -hmm. even smacks of being controversial, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you'll come to mm -hmm. us, at which time we can review it, mm -hmm. and if need be, craft policy to address <coughs> that. Mm -hmm. But I think given where you where we've been and where you are now and where you want to go I would be very reluctant um, myself to consider any kind of detailed policy that could potentially place an obstacle in the way of the progress mm -hmm. that they've made that's just my own personal feeling right. I disagree. yeah and just to follow up I just want to make sure I have an understanding so you have this the gold the silver mm -hmm. and the bronze correct and the idea is in pairs or some kind of teams mm -hmm. go out talk to entrepreneurs, business owners, mm -hmm. and test market their mm -hmm. receptivity. Exactly. Yep. So in a sense, what we're looking at is, I think, a great initial proposal, yep. mm -hmm. but it needs to be fine-tuned, mm -hmm. and it will be. Exactly. Right. I think that's great. Thanks. Michael. I too. So I, I think I would subtly disagree with uh, what you were just expressing in the sense I don't want to hold things up and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sort of get in the way of progress, so to speak, but I think it does get to a place where we're going beyond what's traditional education into, you know, there's a commercialism marketing stuff that is not the purview of schools. Um, and so the issues that we raised in previous discussions, I think we would want to actually revisit and codify it in some place. And I, th I don't remember, I mean, I'm excusing myself because I wasn't on the policy committee at the time. So um, I know we talked about it and then we thought, well, it's not ready for prime time and we don't want to get in the way, but it seems like it'd be worth revisiting it, mm -hmm. being cognizant that we don't want to ha have it Approval be contingent upon your being able to move forward, but I think as it advances, it gets into murkier waters, and for everybody's comfort and clarity, I think this way you know what to do, and we know where it's going, and that would be the responsible way to look at it. And I forget where it sat. I think we agreed on a procedure that Mark would recommend to Maria, and Maria would be okay with, but we never got to the policy place, I right. think. Exactly. Well, so, so I'd like to make a process recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, it seems as if Rich, with Roy's help, and, and his group have have really situated this right in terms mm -hmm. of being patient, being methodical, Definitely. thinking mm -hmm. pilot first. So what I would propose is that as a result of that initial mm -hmm. phase, they're going to come back with a set of people that they've spoken to. And I think that more than anything else is going to inform our sense of what the recommendations about mm -hmm. policy. Because mm -hmm. we need to settle the question. Local, national, yes, we, yes. we need to settle it. And I would agree with Michael that it needs to be in writing. But I would say let us come to you with a set of recommendations based on the work that he and Roy yeah. mm -hmm. and the team is going to yeah. do. Because right. that will anchor it in reality. So. Right? And so part of our, whatever update we do in the winter, I would suggest that we come to you with sure. a set of recommendations that, that tries to take these questions on. That's good. Okay. Um, Mark, I think on, on the budget side of all of this, I think there's, there is a sense of urgency <coughs> there that we need to move both in terms of yeah. what you're doing <laughs> and what we do via vis-a-vis -vis policy fairly quickly so that we don't, en we don't endanger the athletic program through inaction or, or um, delay. 
Um, so there, there is, I don't want to rush you, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, like I said, I, we would like to get this started in the next couple of weeks and, and hopefully be, you know, be coming back together as a group after the holidays. And, um, Michael, that's your boss. Michael? Yeah, I would just support what Mark said, and I think it, it, it's a little bit different from when, at least the way I understood mm -hmm. you understood it, Kip, is there is an sense of, there's an sense of urgency in terms of engaging and seeing about bringing in revenue. In terms of the policy, it seems like the prudent way to be looking at it is to sort of get the on-the-ground information and get a sense of the landscape, and then mm -hmm. we should adopt the policy in a reasonable, appropriate manner, so we're not going to take forever, but I don't think we have to zoom it either. Right. Uh, Shabazz. Thank you. Um, just a point of information uh, mm -hmm. uh, here. Um, my mother, who was a school teacher, uh, always received complimentary passes mm -hmm. to athletic events. Mm -hmm. She didn't go, but she'd give them to my father, who would take me mm -hmm. on Friday nights to the, to the different games and all of that. Um, are there such passes for teachers? And also my uncle, who was on the school committee in my hometown, uh, or school board, as they called it there, uh, he also received complimentary passes. Is that the case for teachers and for school committee members? No, we haven't actually, we haven't had a practice of doing that in, that, that I've been a part of, it, you know, in the last two years. Um, and I'm not aware of anything like that before. Yeah, there was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there? Something to consider. Yeah, we don't anymore. A long time ago. Yeah, okay. <laughs> not that I remember. I hope no. I'm not getting myself Something back when you were a student. I went to a game for yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> I was out on the ice at that point. <laughs> I'm sorry, Trevor. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, echo that none of us want to stand in your way, and we all recognize the yeoman's work this is, and of course we're all behind it. And just like all team sports, everybody has a role to play on the team, and so you are the point guard making, pushing the ball forward, making sure that all this happens. But the responsibility is going to fall on us, not if not um, 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 questioning you or second guessing you at all. But you don't want the responsibility of there's a big controversy and this happening and it's all on your head. You want us to be the team players that take that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so as part of our responsibility, we have to say he's pushed the ball forward and he's talked to these people and these are the people that are willing to give us money. So now we can craft a policy around these people that we like because they're going to give us money. <laughs> Let's make a policy that <laughs> includes them. And that would be codified. I think it's very important for us not to overlook that before making him go as quick as he can. We got mm -hmm. That's important. Exactly. Well, I just want to, I'd love to just say thank you. And mm -hmm. I want to thank the, the mm -hmm. boosters and mm -hmm. all the people in our community who support athletics. And I don't even think we have a sense, like we can't even scratch the surface amount around the amount of time right. and effort mm -hmm. that our um, community members and parents and students put into raising funds for athletics. So I would like to say the greater thank you mm -hmm. um, to all yeah. of you. For sure. Don't want to take any of your thunder. Oh. Make it happen. No, exactly. <laughs> thank you. Make it happen. Mr. Johnson. Um, thank you, and if you could pass yeah. that along yes. to yes. Thank your you. cohorts, um, I think we're deeply grateful to all the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. And Rich, I think the only way I can express um, any recognition of your work is to, to characterize it as due diligence, mm -hmm. that you have um, taken the necessary steps to not only um, resuscitate the athletic program, but to uh, preserve it as well. And I think that's Thanks. very admirable, and um, you're deserving of our, um, our support and, and respect for those efforts. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. I Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Um, just a note on the policy. Um, I'm uh, more than willing to put it on the agenda for the policy subcommittee, but not yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll reserve that decision for down the road a piece. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Michael, well actually first of all I'm going to ask Maria to share some um, good news sure. um, with us regarding the, um, the planning board and then I'm going to ask Michael to give us an update on where the planning board is as we speak. Yes, so we, yeah, thank you. So I guess the best way to describe this is that we have received some feedback from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Interest, and they've expressed strong interest in supporting our efforts toward the first stage of our regionalization grant. Um, they have asked us to look at what it might be on our budget if we were to reduce from, I think it was 90-something thousand 99. to 62,000, wow. which we will be spending some time tomorrow working toward. But um, very, very good news at this moment. So let's hope for the best. We'll do some heavy work tomorrow to make this happen. 
Right. So wonderful news. That is good um, news. Kudos, if I may interrupt you just for a second, yes. Michael. Kudos to Michael who, um, yes. and Andy, both of whom yes. are sort of spearheading the, mm -hmm. the grant writing process. So thank you very, very much, Michael. My pleasure. I uh, really appreciate the work. A tremendous amount of work's gone yes, into this. Um, the board's meeting again tomorrow night, mm -hmm. and so preview. Um, well, I was going to walk down a couple of the different yeah. things. So funding, yes. half of the story has been told, yes. almost. Absolutely. Um, since the last we met, I believe, we submitted the Community Innovation Grant to a and f um, And the staff of the region did a fantastic job in a quick turnaround, really looking at if we were to regionalize, what would that take? Um, there was some stuff that was sort of related to the process that we knew, mm -hmm. but there's all this infrastructure stuff in terms of IT and materials and auditing software. I mean, a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff that was just not visible from the get-go. Um, so we turned that around, that got submitted, mm -hmm. and we're supposed to hear in January. Um, so being that it's the state and being that there's financial mm -hmm. stuff, maybe it'll be February, but um, it's all within the time frame, the DESC timing is really essential because mm -hmm. as we start prepping for what might be another step, it's nice to know that we've got things in order. So it's all sequenced. Um, the only other thing, well, if we, if the funding doesn't come through with the CSC or if, if it turns out that the funding is significantly cut, we're just going to, I think the reality is sort of a heads up that, you know, and these are all big ifs, but if the regional planning board decided that we wanted to move forward in March and we needed to look good funds, we would have to sort of figure out where those come from. So just a sort of preview. Hopefully they'll fund it in full and we won't have to worry about it. Um, so in terms of the work of the committee, there's a ton of stuff going on. So the <coughs> quote unquote standing committees, there's governance. No, I'm sorry. There's communications and timeline. There is education and there's finance. Um, and those sort of are moving out. The education committee has been pretty busy working with the education consultant. Um, and then we have these core issue committees, which we've also been rolling out. Um, and those are sort of short term, and they're looking at sort of the nuttier issues or nuttier issues. Um, so governance is one of them. Trevor and I are involved in that one. Um, and looking at what are the constructs in terms of governance, whether it's K-6 or K-12. Um, we have to comply with one person, one vote um, constitutionally. Um, and the state gives you five pathways to do that. And so we're trying to figure out how to do that in an innovative way that responds to the fact that we've got one big town and three small towns and definitely mind bending. But that's we're gonna report out tomorrow and then a full report out in January. That's the intention for all these core issues. Um, the other one is, I can't tell you what the, the name of it is, but the concept is <laughs> small schools are the community centers of the towns and mm -hmm. how do we value that and preserve them in a way that's responsible. Um, so you can't say we'll never close a school, but we want to do everything to preserve that character. And so how to deal with that. Um, that's especially pertinent. You well. Thank you. <laughs> the committee that shall remain nameless. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, and then there's a third one, which I believe is working, but I'm not fully up to speed on what they're doing. But the idea is if we went to K-12, to how would we preserve a focus on the K-6 to so it didn't mm -hmm. get swallowed up into the bigger hole? Mm -hmm. um, so again, tomorrow there will be an initial reporting out to the committee, um, a fuller one in January. And the idea is... We've got a, what we've articulated is if we're going to move forward with a recommendation, we might not have all the details and the answers, but we have to have a level of assurance that they're able to be figured out. Um, so we know the pathway, we just, but it's not like it's a gaping hole that we can't agree or there's no solution. So that's our goal for all three of those. Um, in terms of community engagement, uh, the consultant reports are due back in January sometime. I don't know exactly when in January. And we now have, you can all write this down, February 2nd is the day that the consultants are going to be reporting out to the general community. Um, and so I, it's, we're planning on one to three, um, with the idea being that children's sports will be over and lunch will be over <laughs> and people can then come. Um, and the intent is rather than have the board be sort of an intermediary, which is describing secondhand what the findings are to have the consultants actually do the presentations and then mm -hmm. subsequent to that have question question and answer time um, so really that's it's, it's a we're going to have a big push for getting people out in communication we're going to have in the high school auditorium is the plan I believe um, right Debbie it's high school no middle, actually, school. Uh, middle school okay auditorium. okay middle school auditorium um, but as many people as we can get it really the idea is to get direct communication going um, and then just evolving issues 
Um, one, I don't know if we've, I've mentioned it here, but it's clear that collective bargaining and staffing issues are, you know, staff is a key constituency and stakeholder in this process. The tricky part, we need to get some legal support at some point, which is where the DESC funding will really be helpful, <coughs> is to understand what the process is because we can't answer questions that are attached to collective bargaining, but people want to know stuff. And so understanding when we can talk about it, what we can talk about, all that stuff, um, it's a sort of tricky and it's all legal. So understanding how to be responsive within the realm of the constraints that we have. Um, and then lastly, we are, we. The committee agreed to submit special legislation um, for some of the governance issues, and I don't think I mentioned this last time. Um, in order to comply, this is sort of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So in order to comply with the one person, one vote construct, um, there's five scenarios, as I said. Two of them involve district-wide elections. So everyone from all towns in the district, the regional district, could vote for candidates, and they can either be from each town or just at large. Um, but interestingly, in state law, there's no construct for district-wide elections. Elections are done on a town-wide basis. So even though the, the state says you have to do it this way, you have to ask for special legislation from the state to do that. Um, and the legislative session starts in January, and the deadline is mid-January. So um, Andy Steinberg is working with Senator Rosenberg to submit legislation on that and then also some other governance construct that we're trying to play with and see if it works um, and that's just a heads up um, the idea is we can submit it it just has to get into the hopper if it's not relevant it gets sent to committee for study and a slow death and it never gets acted <laughs> on again um, but if you don't get it in the hopper in time it's just a lot of hoops to jump through um, so as Kip said the next meeting is tomorrow at 6 and it's going to be in the middle school um, we've been making the rounds of the elementary schools to get um, information and tours from the principals and we're going to use this time in the, at the middle school to understand how the dynamic is of sixth graders coming to seventh grade from the different towns and have the administrators talk to us about that. So I know some people have come to the meetings and please keep coming. It's continuing to be interesting. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I think to sum up. Um, well, what was it? I think it's important for everyone at this table to understand that the train keeps rolling. <laughs> um, and um, it's sort of picking up momentum, particularly now with the, the grant, if it is in fact coming through. Um, it really kind of helps pushing the process along. And I say it's important for all of you because um, Catherine and I, for example, we met with the high school um, school council uh, earlier this, this, this evening. And it was true to form, I think, in that um, there are a lot of folks who sort of are hearing things, but the d level of, of, of knowledge and awareness is really still incredibly low. So I, I certainly, even though we don't know um, all the details, I think it's important for each and every one of us at every opportunity that we have that presents itself that we engage people in conversation about what is going on. Um, if, uh, otherwise, many people are going to be hit all of a sudden, and they're going to say, well, why didn't you tell us sooner? Um, so every opportunity that you have, if you could, please share what, what you know up to this point, and just to start that process of public information. Shabazz? Yes. Well, I had a question for Michael, but what you're raising, though, uh, I remember, school, which school council? Is this site-based, or is this student? Each so school council, um, school, uh, school was, based. Um, Okay, so, so site-based council. Michael, so impact issues in terms of collective bargaining units is not something we put forward to the consultants to look at? My understanding is you can't talk about issues that are negotiated in the collective bargaining agreement because you're not, if you were to do that, you wouldn't negotiate in good faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the tricky part is how do you, if, you know, so the big question, for example, in the small schools is, if I was part of a K-12 region and I was a teacher in Shutesbury, could I get moved to Pelham without my say-so? It's a really legitimate concern, I think, on many people's parts, <coughs> but we can't address it because that's a negotiated thing. So how do you deal with that is we don't understand. But we're talking about a consultant who just kind of traces out what the processes are, that, so they can't even look at, at that level? Well, we, level? Have, we haven't hired a legal consultant yet. We've hired an educational or finance. Okay. So with the DES money, the idea is to get a legal consultant who can say, Very good. this is the path and this is how. I'll follow you. Okay. Uh, Rick and then Trevor. I guess one thing I'm concerned about is that 
I don't feel like the general public is going to really get involved until the real <laughs> details are out there. Yeah. And right. it seems like that can't happen until certainly after March. Mm -hmm. And March. because it, it's in March, we decide right. whether to even go ahead or not. Um, and it just feels like an awful short time from, you know, April, May or whatever to the fall town meetings to get details out there, hear, you know, hear all the stuff about it and, you know, maybe be able to react and change details. And mm -hmm. So I just, I'm concerned about that. That's Trevor? So I'm, I'm very glad to hear what Rick is putting forth and what uh, 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 Shabazz is putting forth. I'm expecting that the community will get more involved after January. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to make sure that it's not misconstrued what, what Kip is putting out, that momentum is going. But what the momentum is for is momentum for we to have a minimum threshold to have a conversation about whether we should go forward, not momentum about this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can talk about this and it sounds pie in the sky yeah. until and unless we have enough information that we mm -hmm. can say a yay or a nay on it, that this is mm -hmm. a good idea or not. Everything up until that point is all speculation. We have hired, we have the, the, the money that we are describing is money so that we can pay some experts to tell us about a certain amount of issues. And what Shabazz is bringing up is very important. We just ran out of money. <laughs> we didn't have enough money to hire a legal consultant that might be able to pick around at some of those things. And so we could not ask or could not, you know, try to, you know, uh, 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 work that out. But it being a legitimate concern and a legitimate question, we have to be able to say, to residents of, of any town who may be teachers who may decide I'm voting against this because this makes my job unsecure. We have to be able to say, well, this is where we would answer that and how it would get answered and who would answer it. So the momentum is now going towards, now I can responsibly say I have enough information to say to my town whether or not this is a good or bad idea. Not that the momentum is, we definitely gonna do this. Michael. Yeah, I was just going to respond to, I think, Rick's observation, which I think I've lived this stuff long enough that what you say is true. Is, you know, people don't necessarily pay attention until it gets real and very close. Mm -hmm. The design of it, um, and it sort of gets to what Trevor's talking about, is that at each stage, there's sort of a little feedback loop. So, you know, we got the consultants. The first, the, we, the first feedback loop with the public would be February 2nd. So here's what they're saying. And then we're planning in February to, at each town to have separate <coughs> forums to hear what people think based upon that. And then based upon both of those points of information, we make a, a decision or recommendation to move forward in March. Following that, we then have another forum to collect people's input before the regional agreement gets constructed and then do a draft and then collect. So with each, I think you're right, with each stage where there's more specific information, more detail, there's stuff you can comment on because it's like, okay, that clause and that thing, I like that and I hate that. Um, so I think there is going to be increasing engagement, but we have to keep circling back because I guarantee if we're going to vote in November, in October, someone's going to say, I didn't know about this. Right, exactly. <laughs> Catherine? Yeah, no, I was just going to, I was, I was going to sort of address it with exactly what Michael said. And, and you know, I think um, the board probably everybody here who's been involved in trying to get the word out to the public is, is aware of exactly what you're talking about, Rick. Um, but um, we have a subcommittee for that, too. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and sort of this, but this notion of, the, of concentric circles. And so I think there will be some critical mass in January and a, and a larger one in February. And I think as word spreads, because my um, experience today at the high school council, but I've also been to all the Amherst elementary schools and the middle school as well, is that when people hear it, they um, have a lot of questions. And one of the things that happened today, and we've done at all the, the council meetings, is to say, you know, go talk to people. Um, because we really want to hear from you. And, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I am getting an, a lot of feedback about people are interested. <laughs> They just, you know, somehow we just have to put it on the radar screen. Yep. Because once they hear about it, they do want to hear more. Even if you don't think you can um, knowledgeably speak with them, tell them to go to the website. Yeah. Um, Regionalschoolplanning.com. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Annie? I was going to just reiterate what they said. Then. As we get more information, and it, we're learning, like Trevor said right now, even just trying to get the information, and when we have it, then we can share even more. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> there's been a, a ton of time and effort on the part of the board at this point to really, this work has been amazing amount of hours. Mm -hmm. And should the board decide to go forward with a you know regional agreement of one sort or another, it doesn't, that's, there's then a really big push for sharing information and gathering input. So this, I want to just say again, the amount of work that people have really put into this is, is substantial. Mm -hmm. And um, if they go forward, <laughs> if something goes forward in March, it's not done until November. So it's a long haul for people. And I just want to recognize, you know, that work. Well, thank you. Can I just say that? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a lot of hard work. We're not even half really hours. Yeah. No, we're not. No, but, we're not. you know, I'm we're saying optimistically. You, know, you guys are doing a great <laughs> job. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank um, you. Just one other note on subcommittee. The policy subcommittee meeting is Monday afternoon at 5. Um, everyone on the committee, I hope, has the agenda. Um, and Michael, Michael, thank you for your draft revision of IGA. I appreciate that. We'll talk about that on Monday. Um, also, please note the calendar. Um, we don't meet again as a regional committee until January, but we have a joint committee. We have a joint committee meeting on the 18th, next Tuesday, 6 o'clock, with Judy yes. Tate. So please mark that on your calendar. Um, it's when is that? Next, a week from today, tonight, at 6 o'clock, <coughs> first Executive hour. Session. Executive oh. session. With Judy yes. Tate. Yes. For one hour prior to the Amherst School Committee meeting here. Here. Yes, please. Um, in regards to future agenda items, um, if you look at the rest of, um, well, the next couple of months, yeah. the agendas are packed. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to request of members of the committee that unless something is really burning a hole in your pocket, that <laughs> you wait until um, <laughs> sometime in March <laughs> to put it on the agenda, <laughs> uh, because there's just an incredible amount of business to take care of over the course of the next two and yes. a half months. So. Um, with that in mind, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Yeah. So moved. I move. We adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Thank you.